All right. And so I've started the webinar and I'd like to say, first of all, hello to everyone. Um, my name is Andrew McCullough and I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this afternoon's panel. Um, I oversee alumni programming and outreach for the Critical Language Scholarship Program, uh, which is a Department of State program that supports American students from across the United States to participate in immersive language programs in what are called critical foreign languages. Um, that is languages that are especially important for America's engagement with the rest of the world. The application for our summer 2022 program is open right now, and we're going to put a link in the chat box so that you can learn more if you don't know a lot about the CLS program yet, or if you're interested in starting an application. Um, but uh, with that, we'd like to get our uh, panel underway. And so I'll start, first of all, by saying I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague, Stephanie Lee from the CLS program. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Lee, and I am a program manager. Uh, I work specifically with the Arabic, Chinese, Indonesian, Japanese, and Korean institutes. It's nice to be here. Thanks. Um, today, Stephanie and I, we're really fortunate to be joined by a panel of former CLS participants um, who have generously volunteered their time to share their experiences on the CLS program especially in the context of making study abroad uh, more accessible for students with disabilities or for those who manage chronic medical conditions. Um, although a significant number of Americans and American students identify as having a disability, as recently as 2015, they only made up about 5% of Americans who study abroad. Um, the challenge is even more pronounced in the countries that are less common destinations for study abroad, but are nonetheless essential for America's engagement with the world, such as the countries that the CLS program works in. For CLS, uh, representing the diverse experience of Americans abroad in our program is extremely important, um, as well as providing equitable access to the opportunities of study abroad, language learning, uh, and engagement with other cultures. And so we seek to uh, break down barriers and provide support to the extent that we can um, to students uh, from all backgrounds. And so we wanted to hear specifically for this panel directly from the experiences of previous participants uh, to talk about the challenges of study abroad uh, more broadly, um, and also about what life was like for them studying abroad, um, what perspectives they brought with them uh, to their study abroad experience and what perspectives they gained through participation in study abroad. At the end of the day, uh, we hope that this panel will provide some perspective and encouragement for applicants to the CLS program or who are considering uh, participating in another study abroad program, as well as an opportunity to learn for advisors and university staff who represent the programs on their college campuses. Um, and so with that, I'd like to give our panelists, uh, who are the stars of the show, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, and I'll ask uh, to start with uh, Stephanie, who appears right under my picture, um, if you could introduce yourself uh, to the audience. Absolutely, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm Stephanie Collins. I participated um, in CLS in 2015. I was in the Chinese language program, specifically Dalian. Um, and I currently am an HR consultant and just got my master's degree in HR. So yeah, really excited to be here and uh, working with everyone and to answer your questions. Oh, and I, I can also mention, um, I identify as having a disability, particularly being legally blind. And then uh, Marley, would you like to go next? Get myself off mute. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Marley McDaniel. I participated in CLS in 2016. I went to South Korea to study Korean. I was in the city of Gwangju. Um, I graduated from the University of North Alabama with a degree of interdisciplinary studies. I currently work as an accountant for Marriott Hotels. That's me. Oh, and I have a physical disability. Uh, Shabir, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Shabir Agabas. Um, I participated in the CLS Persian program based in uh, Dushanbe, Tajikistan, both in the summer of 2020 and 2021. Uh, most recently, I was at the Middle East Institute at Columbia University in the city of New York, um, but I'm now based in Arizona. Um, after I finished this uh, most recent CLS, 
I received the Roshan Institute Fellowship for Excellence in Persian Studies from the University of Arizona, and I'm working here on my PhD. And I volunteered to uh, participate in the seminar today because I'm physically disabled and deal with chronic pain, but was able to uh, successfully complete two uh, virtual programs. And Abigail. Hi everyone, my name is Abigail Hawkins. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I participated in CLS Arabic in Meknes, um, Morocco last summer and the summer previously in Muscat, Oman. Um, currently I am a senior at George Mason University studying Arabic and international relations, as well as interning through IREX um, through the UGRAD Global UGRAD Pakistan um, exchange program as program intern. Um, and I am here with you all on this panel today um, as somebody who lives with several different chronic illnesses. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to add a quick note before we get into asking some questions to our panel. Um, first of all, if you have any questions during the course of the panel, I'd like to invite uh, audience members to submit those using the question and answer um, button function on Zoom. Um, we'll be happy to try and get to those questions before the end of our time here, if we can. Um, but if you have any specific questions, a sensitive question that you'd like to address, for instance, to an individual panelist, I want to invite everyone to please contact us at CLS at AmericanCouncils.org um, and just let us know that you want to get in touch with one of our panelists. We'll be happy to share your contact information with them so that you can have a, a private conversation about that, um, if that's what you would like to do. So Stephanie, I'll hand the microphone over to you. Great, um, and I think now we're all excited to hear more from our panelists. So I will go ahead and then uh, pitch the first question to Abigail and we can have the rest of the panelists take turns if you're also interested in, in answering the question. Um, Abigail, the first question is, what was your motivation for applying uh, to the CLS program? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so my motivation for applying for CLS, um, I, as I said, um, did CLS Arabic twice. Um, I went into my undergraduate studies um, having no previous experience. I grew um, with the Arabic language. Um, I grew up in rural Vermont um, and my hometown was named a refugee resettlement site. So I was able to um, build connections with some Syrian refugees who had moved um, to my hometown. I really wanted to continue that and also friendships I had made um, with friends who spoke the language. Um, in my um, university, I was able to start studying Arabic and then study abroad the summer after, um, pursuing kind of that year of um, Arabic need required to study CLS. Um, I had noticed that I only was able to really fit in um, a three hour a week kind of Arabic, not super intense um, class schedule at my university. Um, and when I was able to study abroad, I saw immense progress in the ability of speaking and being able to like train my ear to understand um, the Arabic conversationally, um, as well as improve my reading and writing. Um, I really wanted to have that opportunity to have that intense um, language study. Um, so I applied for CLS my first year, fortunately was able to attend the program um, through Muska Oman. Um, I had an incredible time. I made so many great connections with my cohort um, and made such, pro or such um, fa like fantastic progress in my language learning um, and was much more confident in my classroom experience when I returned back in the fall to my university, um, so much so that I reapplied um, and fortunately was able to then study through MECNIS. Um, so motivationally, um, it was the best opportunity for me to be able to improve my Arabic skills and uh, gain confidence in, um, in my language studies and then my other studies. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, do any of our other panelists want to answer this question as well? Go ahead, Marty. So I um, wanted to study Korean out of an interest that grew out of just watching Korean dramas. And this was before Korean was cool, like it is now. And at the time, there was literally no college in my state, my whole state that offered any classes on Korean. And so being able to go to CLS was an opportunity for me to 
encouraged a interest that I had that I had literally no opportunity to, to otherwise, which is one of the really great things about CLS. Like these are languages that are hard to find classes for. So this is a really amazing experience to get to go do. And I mean, it. I was able to make a lot of progress in the time that I was there and was able to then you know, pivot that experience into more study abroad experiences that were really beneficial to, you know, my ability to grow in the language and, and to do something that I hadn't thought was possible, so. That's great, thank you. And we, we love hearing the experiences that uh, CLS sparked um, a lifelong journey of wanting to continue studying abroad and continue to study the languages and cultures um, our students uh, study through CLS. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Stephanie and Shabir, are you, would you guys like to share or? Sure, I can definitely hop in. Um, yeah, I was really drawn to, to CLS um, Chinese for a couple different reasons. I studied the language in my high school. I was really lucky to have a, a Chinese program in my high school. And then when I got to college, I found, I think very similar to Abigail, you know, you could dedicate, you know, three or four hours to it per week, but it wasn't immersive and, and I wasn't seeing the the acceleration that I really wanted because I really wanted to immerse myself in, in Chinese and, and really, you know, grow into that language. Um, and then I think so. So that was a really big reason of it. And then the other thing that I wanted to do is kind of um, build my confidence and prove myself. Um, I'd gone abroad once before and I really wanted to kind of build this confidence and build the skills to be able to live and study and learn another language abroad specifically. Um, so those are a couple of the big reasons. And then I, when I got there, I was able to accelerate my language so much. It was, it was, you know, day one to the last day were totally different language skills. Um, I felt like I could really have actual conversations with people and wasn't just struggling through, you know, beginner languages. I felt like I could actually have, have real conversations and real dialogues. Um, and I really built up my confidence by the end too. I, I felt strong in my ability to live and learn in another country. Great, thank you so much. And Shabir? Yeah, so my uh, biggest uh, motivation for applying to the CLS program was, um, so basically I've studied several different languages at the university level. And most of the time, the professors were usually native speakers. Um, mm -hmm. When I started to uh, study Persian at, at Columbia University, the professor was actually not a native speaker. And I was very impressed by their, their excellent skills um, in the language. And then she uh, told me that she participated in the CLS program. So um, seeing her success in the language, I said, okay, if she can uh, be successful in this language, then so can I, so I, I applied. Wow, that is a, a great endorsement for the CLS program. Um, we would have to uh, get the name of your professor from you uh, after this panel. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Andrew for our next question. Yeah, and, and we'll start with Shabir this time. Uh, Shabir, I know for, for the CLS program, uh, you were able to participate virtually because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've all been sort of living in a, in a virtual world for the past couple of years, um, hopefully to end soon. Um, but you've studied abroad before. Um, and I wonder when you were applying to CLS uh, while it was still going to be in person, um, what were your biggest concerns when you were applying and uh, how was that informed by your previous experiences? Um, so previously I did uh, study, for example, Arabic in uh, Jordan and in Egypt. And in these places um, uh, where I studied, there weren't um, any real accommodations for students with disabilities. So when I was applying to the CLS program, I was equally concerned. Um, so I I actually emailed beforehand during the application process. And they informed me that, you know, um, uh, they provide accommodations and they do not discriminate when it comes to applications. So I was, I was content at that. Great, and I, uh, I have to admit that my Zoom window has uh, glitched. So I can't even see if I'm muted or not, but no one is telling me I'm not, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, I won't then uh, I guess I'll ask uh, Abigail if you want to go next. We'll go back in, in reverse order. Um, would you like to to address when you were applying to CLS or uh, your previous study abroad? What were your main concerns uh, when you were applying and uh, how did your previous experience sort of inform that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, my biggest concerns when applying for CLS was um, knowing that it was an intensive language program, uh, living with different chronic illnesses can be very unpredictable in terms of some mornings you wake up in a flare up and there's just, honestly, it's just getting through the day. Um, and I was very concerned that in my past experiences, I have also previously studied abroad um, in Jordan, in Spain, in Japan, um, kind of kind of all over the place. Um, but my most recent experience studying Arabic in Jordan before applying to CLS, um, I did run into occasions where it just was difficult to try to manage um, like a chronic illness as well as my coursework. Um, and I was concerned that that would be a problem with CLS. Um, so I did send a couple of um, emails before I delved into the application process um, and felt very reassured that I would be able to um, have the accommodations that I needed to make the most of the program and to be able to participate in the fullest capacity. Um, when accepted to the program, seeing the amount of like information that I was able to fill out and ask like for what I needed for accommodations made me feel um, so much more at ease. Um, in the past, I've had accommodation forms from universities and from different programs of studies that basically give you the cookie cutter, this is what you get, or you don't get anything. Um, and I was able to really explain what would work best for myself. Um, and that was really, that was encouraging to know that I would be able to put my language studies first without having to worry about kind of the constant back and forth of advocating for what I needed. Yeah, I mean, that's great to hear as, as an administrator, it's great to hear that uh, that was a experience that gave you heart about uh, the ability to receive accommodations. Obviously for us, um, it is a, it's like a, discursive process and we want to involve uh, the applicant as well as our hosts um, in the host country as much as possible. And so um, we ask for a lot of information, but uh, try to be flexible <laughs> and teach um, our hosts overseas who may be less uh, familiar as we are less, you know, uh, more or less familiar with any individual students uh, situation. Um, we're all sort of together trying to make something that, that works. Uh, Marley, would you like to talk about your experience applying and um, your sort of thoughts and preparation? Uh, yes, I think similar to Abigail, I had a lot of um, concerns about what accommodations um, were going to be available to me. You know, I had done a lot of research on Korea and Korean lifestyle um, through, you know, my interest in Korea. And one of my biggest concerns was I don't sit well on the floor. And that is a big part of Korean culture. And so I was really concerned about that. And so I, you know, when I was in the application process, you know, I was able to talk to them about that. I'm like, this is a big deal for me. I'm very concerned about this. And they're like, it's going to be fine. And, and I requested one of the, on the very long um, form that you have to fill out because they don't want a cookie cutter a uh, solution for accommodations was, you know, I said, I, I think I used the phrase, I needed a raised bed. And I just mm -hmm. meant that not a futon on the floor, but I actually got a call um, from a staff member that was like, what do you mean by raised bed? <laughs> a hospital bed that has like gears? And I was like, no, 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 just not on the floor. And they were like, oh, that's easy. We can do that. <laughs> I was like, would you have done the hospital bed? And they're like, oh yes, we absolutely would have made that work. And I was like, well, that's good to know. Um, so, you know, I, even though I did get to the country and I, I had a little bit of a rough start with my accommodations in that the very first time we went out to eat, we went to a, a restaurant on the floor. Um, they had provided me a chair, but everyone else was on the floor. And so, you know, I had to talked to my, you know, residential director and I was like, yeah, so this is not actually an accommodation that really works for me. So can we maybe alter this? And from then forward, we, we worked it out to where that was not the solution. It wasn't just me in a chair and everybody else on the floor. So they, you know, they worked with them even on once we were there to like meet those accommodations. So that was really good. So that that's can put your mind at ease maybe a little bit because they're going to make it happen. 
Thank you so much for sharing that uh, embarrassing uh, story about our <laughs> failure to meet <laughs> the accommodation. But it does, uh, I think, illustrate the degree to which it's a, it's a discursive process and, and one um, that we're always, uh, you know, somewhere somewhere short of perfect on, but uh, trying our best to, to help and support students for sure. Um, Stephanie, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there was, there was definitely a couple of things I was, I was really worried about. Um, so as, as mentioned, I'm, I'm legally blind. So I was really worried about accommodations and making like the characters big enough and how would my, you know, teachers respond. I was also a pretty new language learner. So I'm like, will, will I be saying the right words? Will they understand me? Um, and the other really big concern I had was definitely accessibility. Um, Cause at the time I was going to school at the University of Oregon, which is very small and easy to get around. So I, I lived a, a you know fairly independent lifestyle being able to go class to class. And I was worried because, you know, China is um, a lot more crowded and like the streets um, I've, I've described it as like that old video game Frogger where you kind of have to dodge between cars, um, which I was really nervous about <laughs> being legally blind. I'm like, I, I can't dodge between cars. Um, and so what, like, what a couple of the solutions were that were absolutely incredible is when I started bringing up some of my concerns is the, the CLS program reached out. And I even remember I had a conversation with, with the director and with the person who actually visited each of the sites in China. And we were going like site by site in China Would the Beijing site work better, would the Dalian site work better? Like, and there were multiple different things like how, how would it be accessibility wise? Me walking around, would it be better for me to be in a dorm or for me to be better with a host family? How, how is the, the heat and the fatigue in the different cities? So it was a really long, thorough conversation that gave me so much trust in the system that they were not in the system, but in the program that they were, you know, thinking about me and trying to help me succeed to the best that I could. Um, and then one other quick thing is I, I found the people, you know, my host family and the teachers to be really, really generous. And they, they felt like they were learning as much from me as I was from them. Um, you know, every time I'd be like, oh, you know, I, I can't really see that it's too far away. Instantly, they changed their tactic and, and they'd continue doing it forward. Um, so yeah, though, yeah, it's it's been it was a really good experience. Awesome. Well, it's very <laughs> helpful for us to hear from from you guys that we've managed to do an adequate job uh, meeting your your um, requirements and uh, making your experience um, as smooth as possible. And I think we can all agree that um, doing our kind of homework and preparation for the program makes um, our experience a lot more successful. And a few of you have, have already talked about preparing for the program um, by talking with staff and, and communicating your needs clearly. So now I just want to follow up on that a little bit more and ask uh, what kind of resources did you guys draw up on to prepare for the program in addition to talking to program staff? Um, and uh, you guys have all, all talked about talking with staff. Um, what was, if you have anything else to add, what was the process like um, working on the, on the accommodations that you, you, you needed? Uh, we can start with Stephanie this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, talking with staff was definitely such a, a huge pillar. I felt like I could always come back to you all. Um, and definitely homework and preparation was was really the key. I felt like some some other resources I reached out to were um, other Chinese language professors I had at my university um, to kind of get their ideas, see what accommodations they had in mind. Um, you know, you know, maybe how how to best adapt accommodations if if that makes sense. And then also just you know really digging into the homework, researching researching China, researching Chinese culture, researching um, you know the the legally blind population in China to, to see what it, uh, accommodations and ad adaptations they use. Um, and then the one thing I'll one last thing I'll mention about staff too is um, it, the staff in the U.S. was huge support as as were they on the ground. So the one of the first few weeks I got there, I was a little nervous because I you know again was living a, a very independent lifestyle back in Oregon and my host family walked me every year, which absolutely was incredible. It was hugely generous and I could not have done the program without them. Um, but I also felt, you know, I was going around with somebody all the time and, and I also 
wanted a little bit more independence. So I talked to the, the resident director. They're like, well, why don't you find like, you know, a really place really close by where you can walk and be by yourself. And that way you can like feel like you have a little bit more independence back while still getting all the like generosity and adaptations that your host family is giving you. And that was a really, really big deal because I felt like I could really, you know, be myself again and I could be independent while still getting, you know, all the benefits of my host family and, and all the accommodations. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll go to Abigail next. Sure. So um, likewise to Steph uh, Stephanie's experience, like having the support of like both the people in the United States first are also having like the support on the ground um, was hugely helpful. For me, the biggest concern I am um, going to study in Jordan was the food situation. I'm trying to mitigate a lot of my symptoms by avoiding certain foods or eating certain ways uh, was something that I really wanted to be able to do just to try to mitigate flare-ups, mitigate um, as much pain as I could. Um, <laughs> while at the same time, I'm still being within a year of like starting to study the Arabic language, knowing that I wasn't going to be able to communicate as fluently as probably I would like to have um, been able to. Um, it was so helpful to have just like reached out with those concerns um, before studying abroad in Jordan was reaching out um, to the program staff and like just explaining like, hey, here's my situation. Um, and being provided with just even like a list of vocabulary to be able to utilize when I would go to the grocery store, when I would go out to restaurants was very um, like, I guess concerned, like relieving, as well as being able to know ahead of time where we're going, being able to look at a menu, do the translations I needed to, which was then was another kind of like fun activity to be able to practice the language, um, as well as not feel like it was something that I would have to make the decision between, should I just not go to avoid the issue? Um, and really having that constant like reassurance. Um, another thing that was, I guess, uh, very, very helpful was um, having just like the, like looking into the application, like having like kind of like all of those like clues, like, hey, these are things you might wanna consider and being able to do my own personal like research into different concerns um, and look into like knowing like other people, like reaching out, I did like some like cold calls on like, um, I had found some blogs of other people living with similar conditions who had um, studied in Jordan, had studied um, actually the like institute that I studied at um, and sending them emails and being like, hi, how did you uh, navigate the situation? How did you navigate the water? Like staying hydrated? How did you navigate in like the worst case scenario going and dealing with like hospitals? Um, and they actually did reach back out to me, um, send me an email. Um, which then like with that information that I was able to ask more in depth um, questions of the program. Um, and it was really, again, reassuring to always receive an answer despite the fact that I was emailing twice a week being like, hey, I have a new question that's like very obscure and very niche. Could you by any chance email that? I always received a response from the CLS staff being like, yep, here's, here's our information or no, we'll follow up on that. And that was always very reassuring to know that even if I'm asking a question at like, what's probably 3 a.m. U.S. time, because I was in Jordan, like, I would know about that. So that was awesome. That's great to hear. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I think makes the CLS program really uh, excellent um, is not our hard work at preparing students, but also the fact that we have um, a, such a broad range of alumni uh, who have participated on the program with different backgrounds and experiences who are coming from different places and studying different things. And so often, even during the application period, when students send us questions about uh, what can I do in Jordan or um, how will, you know, my uh, chronic condition uh, affect my eligibility or ability to participate, um, that we have alumni who we can turn to and ask them to provide perspective. It sounds like you found through like Googling <laughs> random people, maybe some, uh, some really great interlocutors, but we're also trying to build a community of alumni on CLS that can um, help to provide that perspective as well. And obviously all four of you are part of that, um, you know, uh, Stephanie and I, if we sat around for a year trying to come up with, uh, <laughs> you know, 
know-how or to-do guides, we would never be able to replace the experience that you guys have had and that you can share with um, with uh, applicants. Um, Marley, would you like to talk a little bit about that as well? Um, I would say, you know, just trying to do your homework. I, I definitely had a really hard time. Um, I mean, I definitely, I reached out to staff, but, you know, there wasn't really a lot of people that I had ever met in my life that had ever gone to Korea. Um, so I was struggling a little bit. So I, I went to, you know, my, my professors at my school and I was like, have we ever sent a student to Korea <laughs> in the history of the school? And they're like, we have, we've sent about three. And I was like, can you get me their emails? I need to ask them questions about chairs, you know? <laughs> and they were like, okay. And they, they were able to connect me with somebody who had gone to a completely different place, not CLS, just a regular, um, I think they were a Fulbright scholar. And, you know, I, I emailed them a bunch of questions. So even if like, you know, whether you email a random blogger or you reach out to your school's alumni or your professors who might have gone there on a trip, like there's always some people who can ask, you know, questions to, or even if it's not, you know, what do you know about this specific condition and how it affects them, but what is the normal standard? Like, what can I go in expecting? Cause then I can prepare. I mean, I've lived with my condition my whole life. So I know kind of how to make accommodation. So if I know what the normal is, I can kind of plan for what I'm going to do going forward. So. Yeah, that's great. That's a great perspective. Then Shabir, did you, uh, did you have particular um, resources that you drew on in order to prepare for the program? Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of experience already uh, studying the region before you went. Um, were there anything uh, that you did particularly to prepare before participating? So of course, you know, I knew a lot about the region and the history beforehand, but uh, when it came to, I guess, preparing for the program, um, the pandemic started like during the process. So there was no uh, way for me to actually prepare. And um, uh, the first, I guess my first experience with CLS, um, everyone was learning, the, the teachers, the instructors were learning the online process, um, even CLS staff, they were learning, and myself, uh, uh, I, was, I was learning too. Um, but uh, in my opinion, the reason why I was successful is the doors for communication were always open. So I could always email the program officer any time of the day and they would, they would, re they would respond. That's great, great to hear. Um, and, uh... Yeah, we, we certainly are always on email, so <laughs> all day, every day, and especially in, in 2020 and 2021, it feels like, uh, you know, uh, we're still learning every day. <laughs> um, okay, so our next question, and Marley, I'll ask if, if you want to answer this first, um, is when you were on the program after preparing and going through the process of applying, um, how did your experience as a participant on the program differ from that of your other uh, co-participants, your, your cohort? Um, and then did you meet specific challenges um, after day one um, uh, that uh, affected you specifically? And then what were your strategies for overcoming them or, or addressing them? So for me, I think the one thing that kind of differed in my experience versus others was I can get tired out more easily, easily, like more physically tired. And so while a lot of the other CLS participants um, chose to go do a lot of touristy things or sightseeing on the weekends, like I really had to as much as I wanted to go do that, I really had to take a step back and conserve my energy and rest because, you know, CLS is an intensive program. You are using your brain as hard as you can use it five days a week. So if you don't rest on those off days, it's, it's a big trouble. Um, so that was definitely um, um, the main difference was, you know, I was not necessarily getting to um, go out and travel and sightsee to the same extent that um, my co-students uh, were, but I got to spend more time with my host family um, than they probably did. So I was able to really connect. Um, I lived with another uh, single woman 
And so, and we were relatively similar in age, so we were able to really connect and talk. And that was an amazing language learning experience as well as cultural learning experience with her that I got to create this really strong connection that I probably would have missed out on if I had been traveling um, here and there. So yes, I, I didn't get to see all of the things, but CLS, like I had mentioned earlier, was a stepping stone to, to do study abroad again. So I have gotten to do those things. I just couldn't do them during CLS. So, but that's okay. Yeah, sorry to hear that, but also great to hear that um, sometimes. <laughs> Uh, our challenge as administrators is keeping people from traveling too much uh, because <laughs> the experiences that they build in the host family and in the host community are so important. And so I'm glad mm -hmm. that you were able to benefit from those uh, during your time there. Um, then, uh, Stephanie, would you like to talk next about sort of how your experience on program differed from those of that of other students who are on the program and different challenges and how you overcame them? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd say, honestly, mine was very similar to Marley. My condition also tires me out very quickly. Um, and so resting was a really, really important thing for me to keep up my health and to keep up my energy specifically. And again, very similar to Marley. I think that really gave me a fantastic relationship with my with my host family, especially because, as, as I mentioned, they also helped me get everywhere, too. So I also ended up spending um, a lot of time with my host family, which created this really wonderful close bond with her. Um, you know, every now and we'd go like dancing in the parks and, and stuff like that. So it was it was really nice and it was a really wonderful relationship that, I, again, I think if um, I was out traveling more, I wouldn't have got. So I, I think that's really lucky. Um, one small thing too, I found this to be true with CLS and study abroads I've done after too, is I found that the other participants really kind of look out for you. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, um, you know, for, for traveling or going somewhere, or, you know, somewhere that's a little bit less familiar, so I'm not as maybe sure-footed, um, they'll make sure I have my way. They'll, you know, help you give me a hand off trains if I'm stumbling over something or didn't see something and I'm about to walk into it, which happens every now and again. Um, so I'd, I'd say those are the, the two, real, two really big things. Awesome. Uh, Shabir, would you like to take the next, uh, next stab at the question? Um, how did your experience differ from other students who were participating? And then um, how did you, you know, what challenges did you meet and uh, what were your strategies for overcoming them either on CLS or another uh, study abroad? Yeah, so of course, um, studying in person and studying virtually is very different. Um, if you meet me in person, you'll see that I walk with a cane. Um, but virtually, you know, um, my disability kind of becomes invisible. You know, so it's very difficult for the people on the other side um, to be cognizant that, you know, I might be in pain or, you know, I'm dealing with some issues. But what really um, helped me um, was CLS's decision to keep the class sizes very small. So by keeping the class sizes small, um, the, the instructors could focus more on individual students and how to help them out. And uh, alongside that, um, the classmates, you know, we had, you know, WhatsApp group, Viber groups. And like, for example, if I had a flare up, you know, and I couldn't attend, immediately they will be telling me, you know, what I missed and, you know, how I could, you know, participate and um, uh, fulfill whatever goals were for that day. Very cool. Uh, Abigail? Yeah, to echo um, Shabir, um, the per like the fellow participants on CLS are such a strong point of the program of study abroad in general. It's like the connections you make. Um, I am still super close with my um, fellow cohort members um, and being able to just kind of like have that support system of like other people who want to like want to help you succeed, um, even when like maybe like resources aren't like super like available. Like I know over Zoom, it's for me, like it was very difficult. Like I got migraines constantly, uh, which I think everyone is starting to struggle with, um, with things being online. Um, but another um, bright point was always having the support of my language partner and my um, language instructors was being able to have that open line of communication with them that I haven't had nearly as much of at my university. Um, language classes can get pretty large, especially at some of the lower levels um, where everyone's just starting out. Um, so being able to have that like communication where if I woke up one morning and I was like, it's today class is just going to be, I'm not, I'm 
doing my best, but it's not 100%. Um, being able to have that open communication of what did I miss? What can I do to make this up? Um, another point where my, I think my experience being in Jordan was a little different than the other students who attended with me um, was I got very close with random shop owners with the restaurants I frequented. Um, I need to know what ingredients are in certain things. I need to know uh, as a type one diabetic, I need to know like how many like roughly carbohydrates are in this? How much like insulin am I going to take? I got very close with um, the maintenance person in our um, apartment complex where I lived because I needed to have the refrigerator working for my insulin to stay refrigerated. So like all of those just like interactions um, where I would like normally, like I think like in the past, I would shy away from like having to make it very confident, like the accommodations I need. Um, but in this situation, like I did really, I needed to have those things to be able to participate fully, to be able to focus on my language learning. Um, so I was much more willing to advocate and also gave me kind of an opportunity to educate people who maybe had never like interacted with somebody with like the conditions that I live with. Um, so it became a learning point of not only me being able to share that experience, but also then get to have like, how do I own my experience in the language I'm learning? Whereas like, that's not necessarily something that I probably like, that's not going to show up in a vocab unit in a classroom. Um, but it allowed me to really be able to like speak in the language to my own personal experience. Um, and it also allowed me to have like, kind of like, the cute interactions that I got to like really look back on fondly of the cafe owner knowing exactly like the place where I got my coffee every morning way too early before class um he knew exactly what I had in my coffee how I took it would see me in the morning and I knew these people on a first name basis it really like allowed me to build those personal connections where in the past like I maybe would have shied away from that and just would have avoided entirely um but kind of having that language immersion um, allowed me to not only own my language experience and personalize it, but also to make experiences that maybe were uncomfortable at first become a learning experience and become something that I look back on really fondly. Thank you all so much. And you've all sh kind of shared a lot of memorable experiences already, but we do want to um, take a little bit more time to hear about maybe a particular mem memorable experience from your time on CLS. Um, and what uh, you wish you had known before participating in CLS, if there's been any advice that you haven't given. Uh, we can start with Shabir this time. Um, of course, I had many uh, memorable experiences, but I guess one uh, memorable, memorable experience I can speak about is um, a lot of times, you know, this disabled students, you know, they can be timid and not want to share, you know, their thoughts or, you know, participate in different events. Um, but the CLS uh, uh, instructors, they were very kind and they, they really promoted um, my individuality, I guess. So I really presented, um, like I have, a, I have a deep interest in Persian poetry. So I was able to present um, several times uh, last year as well as this year, um, different poems that I found interesting. And regarding, um, what I wish I had known um, before participating in CLS is um, uh, the need to be, I guess, uh, cognizant about uh, current affairs. And really, you know, I, I, you know, work most on historical things and I don't really uh, pay attention to, uh, but um, really um, it allowed me to think about what was happening on the ground in Tajikistan and in neighboring countries. Thank you. We'll go to Marty next. So my my most my most memorable experience um, in Korea was uh, during our trip. Um, every CLS, I believe, takes a trip to another city to experience a slightly different part of that country. And we went to the city of um, Gyeongju which is called the Museum Without a Roof. The whole city is, is very beautiful and historical. And um, because CLS is, is pretty tiring, I you know, was being very cautious and you know, trying to conserve energy through this lots of touring around here and there. And so I spent a lot of time at the, the teacher's table 
where uh, the other administrators were kind of also just kind of sitting around and letting the young people go run around. And I had the opportunity to accidentally spoil the end of Game of Thrones, um, which was very popular at the time, um, several years ago, and I had read the books. And so I didn't realize that we were just having this conversation and the administrator who was from the school in Korea was was talking about how much he enjoyed the show and he had mentioned Daenerys and I was like oh well she's you know da 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 and and I was able to have this conversation in Korean and I wouldn't have thought that I would have been talking about Game of Thrones in Korean but you know there we were and I just remember that as being such a unexpected joy um, of the program where, you know, yes, I wasn't getting to go look at all the little things, but I was having a really interesting, exciting conversation that I never expected to happen. And that was a really, really fun part of the experience that was totally unexpected. And, and it's one of my favorite memories, just like the look on his face when I accidentally said a really big spoiler. Um, he was like, what? <laughs> you know, look, ah! <laughs> so anyway, that was a, a top memory for me. Um, what I wish I knew in advance was um, just being as open to learning as possible. I feel like, especially because I, I came out of self-teaching for a lot of my beginning level, I was really nervous about you know making mistakes and doing uh, things in front of other students who had come from more structured language backgrounds. But after about day three, we were all over our head. So we were just all kind of crawling through together and we built that camaraderie. So it was, it was not such a big deal to, to, um, to make those mistakes because we were all constantly making mistakes, but that's how you learn. So just like being open to that experience and, and not getting so caught up in, in the worry of it. <laughs> Thank you, Marty, and, and what a fun story. Uh, we'll go to Abigail next. Well, I'll share like two really short stories. One from like my CLS experience because I was virtual and then one from like my experience studying abroad. CLS, um, we found out, so our cohorts are very small. Um, we had a WhatsApp group kind of straight from the get-go. Um, and early on, I found out that all six of us in our class were vegetarian. Um, so we ended up looking at different recipes that we could cook um, from Oman and cook them together over Zoom. Um, and that was just so much fun to just kind of like meet everyone and have that like shared like commonality of like all of us being like we were all like logging into our classrooms from different time zones from all over the place. Um, different like academic backgrounds, but having that like one like little grounding thing that then we were able to take and have that bonding experience. Um, and like reading like the recipe in Arabic and all of us in our houses being like, okay, like how do we actually cook this? Like kind of the semi-adult, like we know what we're doing um, experience um, was a lot of fun um, to have that like bonding experience and in, in Arabic. Um, and then I think one of the most memorable um, experiences, I think um, for me when I was in country was the ability to go we were at Petra and I was really wanted to go on like the like there was a very like long like mile walk up to the monastery um it was just not in my cards that day it was it was a low blood sugar day I was hanging out kind of where they were selling a lot of things and I was able to kind of get a really good deal on a couple of different kafias that were being sold there um and the fact that I was able to just like go back and forth um, pretty flu like pretty fluidly with the person selling them. And um, he was like asking me questions like, oh, where are you from? Like this and that, like, are you studying Arabic here? And I was able to like understand what he was saying and then be able to like give an answer back. And then I like was just like, I thought about it. And I was like the last time, like when I had just like, what not the last time, when I had first gone into Jordan, there was no way I could do that. I was like still like, like faking, holding my like dictionary to order like breakfast. Like, how do I do this? How do I make sure I get the money exchange right? Like all of these things I was super anxious about. It's like, I'm going to mess it up. If I mess it up, it's not worth doing at all. And I think that kind of was my biggest takeaway from CLS is being able to just 
take mistakes as they come and take them as learning experiences. Um, I think that like at the beginning of not only the beginning of um, when I started CLS, but also the first time I studied abroad um, in an Arabic speaking country, I let my fear of making mistakes and like looking bad um, prevent me from a lot of like learning experiences. Whereas as soon as I was able to accept that, like that's part of the language learning process, it's making mistakes um, and just like making like every opportunity to try um, even if it was going to be absolutely abysmal, there was a time that I was attempting to order, um, oh my gosh, what was it? I think it was, I was just ordering like falafel or something like that at like a little corner store, but I just messed it up so badly. But at the same time, the guy who was like, I was interacting with then afterwards was like, okay, the next time you do this say this, this, and this. And I never forgot it. Every single time I was able to get the falafel exactly how I wanted it prepared, exactly like everything perfect. And I never had the problem again. It was Mumtaz every single time. Um, and I wouldn't have had that experience had I not had to stumble through the first time. So I think that was my greatest takeaway from CLS. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the top advice that we, we hear alumni give to future students. One being speak the target language as much as possible and then don't be afraid to make mistakes and we'll hear from stephanie next absolutely um yeah there's there's so many stories that come to mind um i mean have so many like good meals and conversations with my language partners talking with one of my chinese teachers about shakespeare which sometimes i have trouble understanding in english and then getting to do it in chinese is really incredible um, one that stands out to me in particular is we is our final project that we did. And so our class, which became, you know, really, really quite tight over over the course of the program, made this video about like the beginning was all the um like mistakes we had made. So kind of going back to Abigail. So it was things like things we did wrong at meals or things we did wrong, you know, catching the bus or, you know, really big language mistakes we'd made and being able to kind of like poke fun at ourselves and look at all the mistakes we made and then go back and be like, and now, now we know how this works. Now, now we know what to do with chopsticks. I don't think that was one of them, but you know, now, now we know what to do in this situation or this experience. Um, and that was really, it was really cool to, to be able to bond over that and see how far we'd come um, both ling linguistically and, and culturally. And, and then the last kind of thing I'll say is, um, I think I would have, what I would have liked to know is to definitely, um, trust in myself and have a little bit more confidence because because I totally agree I think I was so nervous about speaking the language at points uh early on that I just I just went in or I just wouldn't try and so once I started to push myself I got so much more out of it so just having the the confidence to make mistakes the confidence to continually try to speak the language even if you're making mistakes even if you're not doing it right um You'll, you'll get there in the end. And, and I've been able to bring a lot of these, these things forward. Like when I travel to other countries and countries I don't speak the language, I feel like, okay, I, I know how to do this. <laughs> I, I know how to figure this out. You know, it, it gave me so many skills that I, that I can use today. So cool. Um, all, <laughs> every one of you uh, is, I'm really jealous of your experiences on the program. Um, having been a really bad study abroad student myself, um, not opening myself up to new experiences and not being, um, you know, certainly not being unafraid of making mistakes. Um, that uh, I think we've got study abroad goals here. <laughs> so thanks for sharing. Um, I, uh, I know that our panelists have uh, other obligations and we're so grateful for the time that they've spent with us, but we wanted to take a minute um, before we wrap up the panel to answer any questions that came in, um, I'm going to ask Stephanie to read those because, uh, like I said, I, my <laughs> user interface for Zoom has disappeared. So, uh, Stephanie, if you want to um, touch on some of those questions. Yeah, sure. Um, the first question we have is, what did you do to travel with medications and make sure, making sure that they were kept safe? Um, I see Abigail nodding. So let's go to you, Abigail. Yep, that definitely was an experience. Um, so when I was traveling to Jordan, I use an insulin pump, I use insulin medications that have to be refrigerated, medications that need to be taken a certain time of day that like are kind of like shift, like not like it was a little bit of an adjustment to like see if I was even able to get them in another country as well as have carrying sharps. Um, 
the first thing that I did was reach out um, to the program director for where I was staying to ensure that I had a bridge. Um, also looking into the airline was something that was really important. I did not realize um, ahead of this trip because I not like I have I've done a lot of travel, but I guess I like had never really looked into it before because I usually am traveling with numerous suitcases as it is. Um, is that one of, if your carry-on is medical equipment, they don't like count it against your carry-on allotment for certain airlines. Um, so that was awesome was being able to have like a completely like separate carry-on knowing it's with me on the flight because it's way too expensive to replace in country. Not, gonna, not something I wanted to do. Um, also just like having, I wanted the peace of mind the entire time I was there that I was going to have the facilities to be able to store everything I needed to be able to, if we were taking a day trip, have like a cool pack so that my insulin would stay cool. Um, to have somewhere to like dispose of my sharps is like asking all of these questions before I got in country. Um, as well as working very closely with putting the program director and my like medical like team in the States in contact with each other. Um, sending emails and CCing each other on that. Um, because whereas my doctors understand like the best practices for like keeping my insulin safe, they don't know, they don't know Arabic. So being able to put them in contact between each other was very helpful. Um, it's a lot of foresight, um, which can be a little frustrating. Um, but there are a lot of like, I realize there's a lot of different websites that have um, people's like experience or they're sharing like what worked for them, what equipment worked for them, um, as well as like kind of like things that were not as expensive for being able to like transport and keep things um, safe. Um, Working, the one thing that was the best advice that I got was to have like a original copies of all of my prescriptions, um, like the like prescription notice, and then being able to have a list of medications in the target language spoken um, where I was traveling to. So I had a write up of all of my medications that I took in Arabic. And that made things so much more seamless when I got to customs to be like, here you are, here's all of what's in this suitcase. You can read through that rather than having to individually Google translate and going through that. I did have, unfortunately, with all of my test strips, um, I was carrying, I think, four months of supplies and they had to open up every single individual container of test strips. Um, so my other advice is arrive to the airport early, just as a general <laughs> rule of thumb. Um, but outside of traveling, um, my experience with my accommodations um, in country were always phenomenal. Um, I had the number of like resources for an endocrinologist if I ever needed anything while I was in country. Um, and that's all just information that from asking questions of the program staff, I was able to alleviate all of my concerns. Um, but there is always that degree of just like do your research ahead of time and like have all of your questions, be obnoxious with answering questions before you leave rather than having to get there and then ask questions and not have the answer. Thank you so much, Abigail. Um, in the interest of time, we'll go to the next question. And um, uh, we know that Stephanie Collins has another obligation has to leave at the top of the hour. Um, so. Uh, Stephanie, if you need to leave before we wrap up, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and, and joining us today. Um, it's been great to see you and um, great to hear about your experiences. Yes, thank you so much all for having me. This was so wonderful. I'm sorry I have to hop off early, but this has been really great. Thank you all for having me. And it was great to hear everyone's experiences as well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And of thank course, you. if anyone else also has an obligation that they need to go for, um, that's fine. <laughs> but um, well, uh, if it's just me and Stephanie looking through the questions, we can do that too. Probably not as helpful. <laughs> just one more question, actually. Um, okay. And uh, this is more of a question probably for us administrators, but probably also helpful for the, for the, um, uh, the person asking the question to hear how much you felt like you had to share. Uh, the question was, how much do you need to share about your disability? And we can, I guess maybe we can start with Shabir. Um, uh, when it comes to, I guess, uh, virtual learning, um, like I said, 
uh, earlier, um, your disability can become invisible. Um, so you do have to uh, communicate to a certain extent with uh, CLS staff to let them know, you know, if you're dealing with anything. But uh, I guess uh, when it comes to, you know, accommodations overseas, there are specific medical forms that your doctor fills out, if I remember correctly. And in that, you know, the doctor has to describe things accurately. Marley and Abigail, anything to add? Um, yes, uh, definitely. You did have to fill out quite a bit of um, medical forms. Um, your, I think there were like several sets, like one set that I filled out and then one set that my college filled out and one set that my doctor filled out just to make sure they were covering every single, every single base. Um, once I was actually in the country, I don't really think it ever came up unless I chose to mention it. Um, you know, you'll, in my experience, my, I'm sitting down so you can't see all of me, but you know, I have an artificial leg. So that's pretty obvious that I have a disability, especially in the heat of summer. So when I'm wearing, you know, shorts and everything. So like, I definitely got a couple of like positive stares, but no one asked. And, and I was quick to volunteer it because it's not a really big thing for me. And actually it was one of my language goals when I went to CLS is I want to be able to talk about my disability in Korean. Like that was one of my major goals that I set for myself to be able to do because I want to be able to answer people's questions if they do decide to ask them. It doesn't personally bother me, but I know it does bother other people and it never would have come up unless I had chosen to bring it up. So yeah. Abigail, do you have anything to add? I think most of the bases have been covered, but I think, um, yeah, to echo what but it's already been said it there's a lot of information that is logistically planned in about your disability if you like choose to disclose that to the program staff and filling out forms for accommodations but then in the experience of being abroad or being on the program it's entirely up to your level of comfort as to what you choose to share um a lot of my equipment is very visible um it's something that like I enjoy. It's a part of um, just, like, my identity. I like to be able to share the information. And it was really cool to be able to share like the different technology that I utilize to manage my conditions. Um, and that was like really interesting to share with other people who I learned lived with similar conditions to me and didn't hadn't had access to that technology. So being able to share different things like that was really interesting. And also, yeah, it was a great point of being able to utilize my language acquisition. And I'll just add a point to that because I know um, right now we are, uh, you know, the application is open to the CLS program and uh, hopefully we have some people who will watch this webinar and are interested in submitting an application for the 2022 program. Um, there are, there is a part of the application at the very end where students or applicants are invited to uh, identify as having a disability or not and provide details um, on their disability. That is only used for um, statistics. You know, for us, we want to know what percent of students who are applying to the program and receiving the award um, identify as having a disability, but we don't uh, use that information to identify individual students. And it's never passed to um, application evaluators. Um, so the people who are making decisions about um, who receives the award and who doesn't will not see that particular question at the end of the application. That being said, um, there is an opportunity in your statement of purpose or other essays to uh, make a choice as to whether or not you want to uh, reference uh, your disability or a chronic condition that you manage um, in, you know, in reference to your identity and, and where you're coming from. Um, and I don't think that there is a correct or a wrong uh, decision in that regard. And people make different choices. And, and certainly we've heard, um, you know, from advisors in, in the field of international education, it's a live topic uh, about whether or not um, statements of purpose, whether it's appropriate for us uh, as educators and administrators um, to be encouraging students uh, to uh, you know, talk about 
their identity um, as a way of, of proving, you know, of, of competing basically for, for a spot on a program. Um, what do, if, if any kind of, if you thought through this before and, and how you represent yourself in the application, um, do you have any advice or a perspective you'd like to share um, on that? Any one of you? I think it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a difficult question. Um, not just about disability, but any sort of identity related. Uh... I think I, I'll take a stab at the question. Um, I think I was on a Q&A panel actually for CLS last week and my best advice for the applications is to tailor it to what you want to learn from the language is to be less focused on like, oh, well, this is what I think a CLS applicant should be. Like, this is what they're looking for and rather present yourself in what, what do you want to get out of CLS? What do you, why do you want to learn this language? Um, and asking like those questions, which can be a little, much more difficult than being able to kind of write an essay to, oh, well, this is what they want to hear. Um, allows for, I know for myself, I personally did talk about um, um, kind of adaptation to like living with a disability moving away to college and how that was really central to like learning what my central identity was and what how to advocate for myself how to adapt to situations um, and how that played into what I wanted to get out of language learning and how I am how that's um, adjusted how I learn languages so really digging in and like seeing what is central to why you want to apply to CLS and that really helps with creating essays that then you can utilize for other things in the future as well um, and have that path of understanding why am I studying this language, which can come in handy sometimes during midterm season. Um, I will add that, you know, I, I know that I mentioned it in my essays um, because it is part of the unique perspective that I have. Um, and like I said, it's not something that I particularly feel like I shouldn't talk about, but I also understand different people have different opinions on it. And the thing about CLS is they are very interested in promoting unique perspectives, not just people who are um, a disability or having chronic illnesses, but like unique perspectives for language learning. Like I attended CLS with a person who wanted to study Korean film. And we had a person who studied Korean dance and we had a person who wanted to be a translator for North Korean refugees. Like we had every kind of person and they all presented that unique perspective that made language learning important to them. And that was the key that got them accepted. I feel like not so much, you know, what school they went to or not, but the fact that they had a unique personal perspective and a reason that they, they wanted to learn the language. Like that's, I feel like that's what CLS wants. Like they want to see that you have a reason and if you show them that reason then that's the most important thing more so than like the personal circumstances of the student so. and should there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up the panel i know we've kept everyone here for a long time i'm <laughs> sorry for that sure, i would like to say um um if you know you have the merits then you shouldn't um i guess uh, let your disability cloud your judgment in regards to applying or not applying. And uh, in regards to, um, I guess, a successful application based on my two times doing this, is if you can, you know, clearly define, you know, your objectives and your goals and how you're going to accomplish them, I think uh, that will definitely help you when it comes to the application. Thank you so much. Um... It's been, I mean, for me, it's been a great pleasure just to see people who aren't my dog. <laughs> and uh, really awesome to talk to you guys about your experience on CLS and applying to CLS. And uh, I really appreciate all of the time that you've given us. Um, we're gonna take this uh, webinar and uh, the recording and make it available to view for people in the future. So um, if you came in late, and you missed part of it, uh, please check back in on our events page at clscholarship.org slash events uh, for a link to the recording. Um, and then uh, again, if you have any questions that weren't answered by the webinar, if you'd like to email us at cls at americancouncils.org, um, we're happy to answer 
any questions that you have. And if you have a specific question for one of our panelists, again, uh, just let us know and we'll put you in touch with them so that you can uh, share that with them directly. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. See if I can end this, even though I have no buttons. <laughs>